Ladies and gentlemen, there are pictures you're all familiar with. Pictures related, for example, to the loss of biodiversity and the sixth mass extension of species. Pictures related to climate change and global warming. Pictures related to land degradation. These are existential threats to human civilization, and we are rightly concerned about these threats. At the same time, however, we live through fantastic times. These are times in which ordinary people, people like you and I, are inventing new ways to change the world. In areas such as food, energy, mobility, housing, ordinary people, men and women, are trying to change things, inventing new ways of producing, of consuming, of sharing. And my question this evening is, can this actually make a difference? Can these people change the world? The task that they are facing is a very difficult one, and the challenge is huge. And the reason for this is that past political choices have led to technologies develop that rewarded economies of scale, encouraged efficiency gains, standardized production for mass consumption, all this in the name of producing waste that economists call growth. And this led to economic actors being strengthened in certain dominant positions, able to shape, in turn, our cultural habits, including how we consume, and allowing these actors to capture the political process. So, the system is very resistant to change. All these elements have co-evolved and have now become mutually supportive. Can, therefore, these small-scale local innovations developed by neighbors make a difference to the world? Can they unlock the system that we inherit from? Now, if you ask this question to these change entrepreneurs, they will typically answer three things. First, we have the collapsonists. The collapsonists say, we don't think the world can be changed. The indicators are red, they say. The pressures are too strong. Our ability to change is too weak. And they warn about the imminent collapse of human civilization. This is not a new story. The Bible already spoke about the apocalypse. And in recent years, we know that some authors have revived this idea. For example, Jared Diamond, in his book of 2005, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, in which he documented the fall of the civilization of Easter Island. Or in 2011, Lester Brown, a professor at Columbia University, who wrote the book World on the Edge, How to Avoid Economic and Environmental Collapse. And more recently, in the French-speaking world, Pablo Servigne and Raphael Stevens, who published in 2015, How Everything May Collapse, a book in which they coined the word collapsology. Now, of course, these are not feel-good stories. They are actually quite gloomy stories. But they are nevertheless quite interesting and indeed quite lucid. I myself have two reservations, however, about this way to effectuate change. The first reservation I have is that I am myself an optimist. I'm an optimist in the precise meaning that Thomas Friedman gave to this word when asked whether he was a pessimist or an optimist. His answer was, I know that pessimists are usually right, but it is only the optimists who ever changed the world. And I believe that collapsology 
if taken too seriously, may lead to depoliticize, to demobilize. It may lead, in fact, to depression. And my second reservation is that these collapsionists are too optimistic in another way. They believe that after the crisis, after the collapse, a new world will emerge based on the values of solidarity and conviviality that we, of course, all cherish. But that is not necessarily the case. In fact, the past crisis we've seen have led to a world that is more, e more unequal, in which the status quo has been preserved and indeed reinforced, a world in which the dominant positions have been further um, strengthened, a world, a world that has become more uh, ruthless and merciful than earlier. So there is a second answer that sometimes we are provided, and that is the answer of the reformists. The reformists say, of course, our role is to change the world. That is what we intend to do. We intend to provide solutions to the system in order for the system to improve itself. That's a very interesting demarche. However, there is a very thin line between trying to influence the system and being co-opted by the system, allowing the system to buy time, to buy legitimacy, not to ask the more fundamental questions about which crisis it is contributing to. Think, for example, of these interesting experiences in which charity-based organizations team with supermarkets in order to receive from these supermarkets unsold food items as they reach their sell-by date, and the charities then provide these food items to families in need. This is fantastic. This looks like a win-win-win solution. Supermarkets win because they reduce food waste. The charities win because they create employment in the social and solidarity sector of the economy. And of course, the families win because they receive food aid that may protect them from food insecurity. At the same time, however, that solution remains a short-term fix. It does not address the major cause of food waste, that is overproduction and the poor management of stocks and flows of food products in supermarkets. So for these short-term fixes to provide a solution, we need to link them to a long-term vision, a real alternative for change. The third answer is the answer of the separatists. The separatists who say, we are interested in producing social diversity. We are not interested in, in, in being involved in politics or with businesses. We fear that we shall be co-opted. So we cherish our autonomy, our independence. The problem, however, is that very often independence, autonomy, come at the price of marginality and premature extinction. You cannot ask people who work uh, after hours, uh, voluntarily contribute time in the evenings and the weekends to change the world. And not all these people are accountants, tax specialists, specialists in social legislation, maybe they do need some outside support. So, the challenge to us, you see, is to think about these citizens-led social innovations that are, at the same time, subversive enough not to be co-opted in the system, and at the same time, robust enough in order to change the world. How to do this? In my university, we've been studying this this chemistry of collective action and how these citizens-led social innovations emerge and how they can succeed. And we found that they succeed if they follow a three-stages long process. First, by building a participatory process, inclusive, in which people working on the same topic, actors of the food system, actors interested in the local energy system form a food policy council, 
a local renewable energy forum, for example, and build trust with one another. This has three advantages. First, it allows these citizens to strengthen their bargaining position vis-à-vis -vis elected politicians. Secondly, it allows new ideas to emerge from these people interacting with one another, and thus they can broaden the political imagination of policymakers. And thirdly, these people brought together form a new social capital. They build trust between one another, and that facilitates, of course, the building of further collective action. Secondly, then, these actors can forge an alliance with elected politicians. And politicians, indeed, can provide support. They can identify subsidies that shall help these citizens' innovations. They can provide some technical expertise. They certainly can help overcome the administrative or regulatory barriers that are obstacles for these innovations to develop and to be scaled up. Thirdly, finally, these change entrepreneurs can try to build alliances with the local economic entrepreneurs that can provide their technical expertise, their know-how, their access to finance, making the citizens-led social innovation more sustainable, more economically viable. <coughs> Indeed, if we remember what cities have done, building on these citizens-based social innovations, we see that these are the processes that they followed. In, in Bologna, for example, they have since 2014 a regulation, a regulation on the care and regeneration of the urban commons that allows the municipality to provide support to these small-scale citizens-led social innovations for transition. In Barcelona, the whole city is making a transition based on these social innovations, particularly in the fields of food and housing. In Ghent, Michel Bowens and Dirk Holemans have studied some 500 citizens-based initiatives based on the idea of the commons in areas such as food, mobility, shelter, and have identified these alliances between the public, the civic and the economic, the policymakers, the citizens, and the local entrepreneurs as the recipe for successful change. Indeed, through such alliances, a virtuous cycle can emerge in which social trust is built between participants, bringing in political support, crowding in the investment from local entrepreneurs, and allowing such an alliance between the public, the civic, and the economic to develop. And so, I would like to close with a, a quote by the writer Dan Millman, made famous by his fictionalized autobiography, The Ways of the Peaceful Warrior. And Dan Millman wrote the following. He said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Thank you. <laughs>